You're listening to the Nightlight Radio Network. This is Dr. Zohara Hieronymus, co-host of 21st Century Radio. We are happy to present this rebroadcast of our show on Nightlight. Enjoy. She is called, by many, the Shark Whisperer. She's a lifelong diver, surfer, water enthusiast, professional scuba instructor, and much more. Ocean Ramsey has committed her talents to the preservation of the great white sharks, and she joins us to talk about swimming in unprotected environments with these amazing beings and why their lives are so essential to preserving the ocean's ecosystem. Thank you for joining us, Ocean. Aloha. Thank you for having me. How are you? Very well, thank you. So you live in Hawaii, Yes, I live in Hawaii. I'm um, I'm from Hawaii. I live in Haleiwa on the north shore of Oahu. So in your biography online, which I read, it, it talks about, you know, you grew up as a surfer, you were always in the water. But it, at what point did you have this feeling that you had something specific to do for marine life in particular? I think around... Probably, probably around the age of 15 when I was um, I was diving a lot and interacting with a lot of scuba divers. And I would have people ask, are we going to get to see a shark? And, um, you know, they would ask in this kind of fearful tone, like, oh, my gosh, are we going to get to see a shark? You know, are, are we going to see a shark? And you're lucky if you get to see a shark would be my reply um, because they're incredible animals, and unfortunately there's not that many of them. And so that kind of became a repetitive interaction that I would have a lot of people that were going into the water and just getting into diving, just getting into the ocean environment, and they had this terrified idea of Jaws, and I don't blame them. I mean, if you watch any traditional media, you know, the news or any kind of Hollywood film, or even open up children's books, generally sharks are demonized, and they're Mm -hmm. portrayed in this kind of malicious manner, which is very, very, very um, misrepresentative of what they actually are. You know, it's so interesting to hear you say that because that's exactly the same story of the bear and many of the other apex animals in their ecosystems is that humanity and entertainment facilities have portrayed them as such predators. And it turns out their their natures aren't like that at all. Exactly. It's the, the misrepresentation. And what really happened, and the whole thing with Jaws, too, is that There were a couple of mistaken identity bites. People don't know very much about sharks at the time, and so it was very easy for Hollywood to kind of fill in the gap. And naturally, humans fear what they don't understand. And so because there wasn't a lot of science going on and there wasn't a lot of behavioral studies and there was not a lot of people spending time in the water with sharks and actually getting to see, understand, and appreciate them for their role in the ecosystem, um, it was just kind of left up to, to Hollywood, and people kind of took that to heart. They weren't it wasn't as easy for people to acknowledge that, yes, this is a fictitious Hollywood thing when they don't know anything about them. Mm-hmm. Now, mm-hmm. what's the excuse? Now we have science that shows how important these animals are for the ecosystem. Now we have divers traveling all around the world, spending you know every single day in the water with the animals, seeing how incredible they are. We know for a fact that they don't look at us as a natural prey item. I mean, I'm a testament to that. I spend every single day in the water with sharks. And I still have all my fingers and toes. And I take people by the thousands every single year out to meet sharks and get to see just how incredible the animals really are. And so it's really unfortunate. I mean, it's it's heartbreaking to the point that I go back to these areas around the world and you see less and less and less sharks. And you get to see individuals and you get to see them kind of as they age and maybe start to reach the age and about the size of sexual maturity. And then what happens, you know, if we have tagged individuals, those tags disappear. They actually got fished out. They got thin. Mm. They got fished for their fins. So 70 to 100 million sharks are killed every year just for their fins. Talk, talk that, to us about that. Not myth. not everybody knows about finning, which I, it's so gruesome. I can't even look at the pictures when they come up. But explain to us what is actually happening and why the sharks are... Um, Basically, you said, as you just mentioned, we kill 100 million sharks a year, and of the white sharks, there's only 3,500 left in the entire world. Why? Why Why this um, sort of appetite for slaughtering shark? Well, it's really, like you said, it's disturbing to you know think about it, and unfortunately to talk about it, but it's, they're killed for a bowl of soup. 
And it's um, it's just a status symbol bowl of soup. It's not nutritious. It's actually toxic. And it's just a cultural status symbol to kind of say, oh, you're prestigious or you're high class. It's um, traditionally coming from the Chinese culture, Mm -hmm. um, which they have the largest population in the world. And their middle class economy absolutely boomed several decades back. And because of that, the demand for shark fin soup just skyrocketed. So in the last three to four decades alone, sharks have been just decimated. And this is the world over. This isn't just around China or just uh, the California coast. This is 25% of the world's fin trade comes from Europe. Um, they're coming all the way to buying fishing rights out off of West and East Africa. They're one of the largest fishing exports is from Costa Rica. This is a global thing. It's a billion-dollar international business um, just to kill sharks. So they kill the shark, they hack off the fins, they're using less than 5% of the animals, complete waste of, you know, any kind of resource. And in a time where we're starting to realize that at the rate that populations of humans are growing, to be wasting any kind of, you know, animal, whether it's a fish or a shark or anything, and just for its fins, just for a status symbol, is it's, quite disturbing. Talk to, talk to some, if you would, Ocean, because as we've discovered with all of these other apex animals that I've done interviews on, whether it's the white bear or the white elephant or the white, I haven't done the white tiger yet, the white buffalo, the white wolf, all of them um, are so significant to the health of the ecosystems in which they live. And like as an example, you know, we kill off the wolves, so they're bigger elks for the hunters. But when you kill off the wolves, you have this whole chain reaction that's decimating to the streams and the forests, etc. So what do the white sharks do for the ocean? Essentially, the white sharks, and not just the white sharks, but all species of sharks, are so important for an ocean ecosystem, a healthy ocean ecosystem, because they are the white blood cells. They pick off the dead, the dying, the weak, the sick, the injured. And that's something that most other species out there, most of the marine species, are never going to touch. And without them, essentially, if imagine you've got a, a fish stock of, you know, a million fish. The shark will swim through all those fish and they'll pick off just the weak, the sick, the injured, the older, dying ones. Um, if one of those fish actually has a skin disease and that spread to all the other fish, you could have that entire fish stock population crash. Mm-hmm. They just die. Or if they don't pick off the weak, sick, injured pinnipeds, those are left to reproduce. Genetically, they're weaker. And also, they're kind of a hindrance. They're still eating food that could be left for stronger and the fitter and for the next generation. So it's to keep the ecosystem in balance and healthy. So without those regulators, without your white blood cells, what's going to happen to your ocean ecosystem? It's what we're seeing the world over. Fish stock populations are declining. Coral reefs aren't as healthy. Pinnipeds populations are spiking, and many of them are starving because they don't have the fish that they need to sustain their populations. So the world over, many ecosystems are out of balance. Now, if we look at places like Palmyra Atoll, that's a very healthy ecosystem, very healthy corals, very healthy fish stocks. And what do they have? They actually have 45% top predators, which means sharks and mesopredators or predatory game fish. So in an, if we can look at correlation studies like that, healthy reefs, and when we see healthy reefs, we see a lot of sharks. When we don't see a lot of sharks, We don't see healthy reefs. We don't see healthy fish stock populations. So there is a correlation. And there's actually a study done from northwestern Australia that actually directly tied that in with science. So we have the science. We have no excuse. You know, we know how important sharks are. We know that they don't look at us as a natural prey item. Um, My behavioral studies out here actually um, play into something called agnostic behavior. Agnostic behavior is territorial or aggressive behavior. It's not necessarily predatory behavior. Right. So sometimes when there's a mistaken identity bite, like oftentimes off of Florida where the surfers go out and they can barely see their toes and limited visibility, and there's bull sharks in the area. Bull sharks are a territorial species, and many people know that oh, there's bull sharks using this area, and they choose to go surf, and they get a bite, and it's it's not a I'm trying to eat you bite. It's a hey, you're in my area bite or what are you bite. Sharks don't have hands. All their sensory systems are on their nose, so they have to go up and investigate. And usually, and this is the type of thing that happens every day and nobody hears about it, usually sharks will come maybe within six feet. They see that 
that's not my prey item, and they just turn and swim away. But nobody hears about that. Mm -hmm. All they hear about are the very, very rare mistaken identity bites. And that's where the animal comes up and bumps and or actually bites, but generally doesn't try and actually consume a person. So it's this outrageous level of fear for not very much threat. It's like, what should we really be concerned about? What about drunk drivers? How many people do they kill a year? How about drowning? 350,000 drownings a year. Um, jellyfish, even. I mean, 40 people a year die just from jellyfish. 50 people just in one state alone just from falling out of bed. But there's this mass hysteria over sharks, so much to the point that people don't care if they're being killed off. And at the rate that they're being killed off, uh, the effects that it's having on the oceans, it, it can mean a huge difference for our future generations. No question about it, and and that's why I've one of the reasons I do this work on the apex animals, and and what we find is when you go actually to native story to indigenous people's stories about these great animals, you discover a reverence and a journey of collaboration and participation that keeps the earth what it is for all of us. Talk to us a bit about that, because if you have lived in Hawaii, and I know you've lived elsewhere, but are there stories about the great wake sharks that the Hawaiian indigenous people tell that talks to the, talks to, you know, their sort of spirit nature and their importance on that level? Actually, the really exciting thing about the Hawaiian culture, or even the Polynesian culture in general, it is different from Hawaii to Fiji to French Polynesia, um, but generally sharks are revered and respected in the traditional Polynesian culture. And they actually attribute some of the first settlers of Hawaii to finding Hawaii by hooking up to tiger sharks, and not with a hook, but actually feeding them um, wild pigs that were brought over so they were stuffed and then lassoing them around the belly and then letting the sharks actually tow their canoes because they knew the sharks would go to land. So they let them tow them for a day or two, and then they let them go, and then they'd use the celestial navigation. There's lots of myths and legends around um, the sharks with amakua. Amakua is a term used to refer to different, not just sharks, but um, different animals as kind of spiritual guardians or almost ancestors. So it's like your grandmother died. Um, her spirit would kind of come back in a shark. And the, the word for a shark in Hawaiian is mano. So if the mano was your amakua, then it was essentially like part of your family. And so you would protect and care for the mano or your shark. And um, there were wars broken out over it if one tribe actually killed some, someone's mano. And um, so traditionally very, very respected. In Fiji, there are... Some sharks are actually respected as gods. Um, and I think it's great to see cultures, traditional cultures, and the way that they tie in with the land and with the sea, with nature in general. They just tend to be a little bit more respectful. And it's unfortunate that I think with a lot of modern-day culture that we've lost the connection to nature um, because we're still a part of it. Even though, you know, we just take, 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 um, we still are a part of it, and ultimately it does affect. I know a big topic of discussion right now is climate change, and so many people feel like, oh, I'm just one person. Like, how could I possibly have an effect on the environment? But everything down to what you choose to consume, and especially plastic, that's kind of a big thing. It's like getting the straw that's covered in plastic and the one time you thing you throw it away. I have to say that one of the most devastating things for me to see is is going out 365 miles off the Pacific coast and going underwater a 1,000 feet over 300 meters. And what do I see in this extremely pristine area that far underwater, that far away from any type of human population? I see plastic, snack trays, and garbage. And it's just, it's, it's shocking to see how far we can really impact the environment. And that's an area that's in complete darkness that nobody ever sees. But our garbage is there. And yeah. It's the choice of, you know, we use a plastic bag and then we just throw it away. We could reuse the bag. We could, you know, choose not to buy plastic. You know, I, I think plastics definitely have their place in society. But it's, um, you know, I was just in Cocos, Costa Rica with uh, Dr. Sylvia Earl, and um, we were following these uh, piles of of birds that were dive bombing down on something. So we went over and checked it out and uh, 
um, sure enough, it was a big pile of plastic. And there were all sorts of things, literally down to a kitchen sink floating there. Mm. There were shoes. And I think what really hit me was the, the number of plastic bottle caps, like water bottles that you drink out of, the plastic bottle caps. And you see these birds going down and trying to scoop fish that are hiding underneath all this garbage, and they're scooping up this plastic. And I'm sure everyone's seen the pictures of seabirds that are dead because of the amount of plastic that's in their bellies. Mm -hmm. So that's becoming a more regular thing. There were tuna that were hunting, and they were trying to get at those fish too, and they're scooping up plastic left and right. There were dolphins that were eating the plastic, and there were sharks that were eating the plastic. There were sharks that were wrapped up in fishing line. There was fishing line just drifting with a discarded net. I mean, all sorts of imaginable, just everyday things that were just floating out there 365 miles away from the population. No, so no doubt you've start. seen things that, you know, we're not going to see. Every once in a while, the media will do some story on the, you know, miles and miles of trash in the Indian Ocean or some other ocean where it's floating now and that it goes on for miles. But so much of what you see with your own eyes and your own heart ocean, uh, most of us will never see. And most of us aren't free divers or scuba divers. And so you you live in a beautiful aquatic world that um, has been so harmed by human enterprise and exploitation, and yet you're still able to see something that really is just so, as you point out, you know, overwhelmingly joyful to the heart. We're going to take a little break, and then we'll come back and talk some more about the the kind of activism that you and others are part of. If you're just joining us, our guest is Ocean Ramsey. She has been called by many in the media the shark whisperer. This is 21st Century Radio, and I'm Dr. Zohara Hieronymus. We'll be back after this. Hello, this is Charlie Russell. I'm the author of Grizzly Heart, Living Without Fear with the Brown Bears of Kamchatka. I have spent my life demonstrating that brown bears are not naturally aggressive, but we tend to make them that way by managing them to be afraid of us. You're listening to 21st Century Radio with Dr. Zoe Hieronymus. So, too, with our guest this hour, Ocean Ramsey. Go to www.oceanramsey.com. She is known as the Shark Whisperer, and she does swim with the great white sharks as one way of bringing attention to their perilous journey among humans. So, Ramsey, when, I mean, Ocean, when you um, look at the white shark, do they differ from the other shark communities in their behavior in the ocean? They do, actually. The interesting thing about white sharks is um, they're more active predators. They're one of few species that are actually able to thermoregulate. And so each species is a well over 400 different species of sharks, but each species kind of has its own niche. And you'll see some sharks um, prevalent in areas where you won't see other sharks. You're not going to have every species in every single area. Um, but they are generally a solitary nomad roaming type species. Um, so when they come together, usually it's for predation or for mating or for other reasons. And when they do come together, um, you get to see a lot of agnostic or territorial behavior because of that. They're fascinating species um, to actually study, and they're extremely role. They're extremely important for their role in the ecosystem as far as what they they like to eat. The juveniles tend to go for tuna. Um, larger fish, and then the adults will actually go for pinnipeds and cetaceans. And if you think about the number of pinnipeds and cetaceans, um, they need a predator as well just to keep their populations in check because it's called a trophic cascade. When you have a boom of one particular species in the marine environment, it's going to have a trickle effect on whatever that species feeds on, or whatever that species feeds on, and down kind of the food web. So, unfortunately, because we're taking out our apex or top predators, sharks, it's having a serious trickle effect. Um, I don't know if you heard about recently in California all the baby sea lions yeah. that are starving. So, again, another you know trophic cascade and effect. Um, there's all sorts of different examples. Of so don't pass that. How does the elimination of the white shark now impact the fact that the baby sea lions are starving? So the sea lions don't have enough food because their populations have boomed in some areas, and their populations have boomed and have been out of balance because 
there's no one to feed on them. There aren't enough apex predators to keep their populations in check. I see. So you'll see this in Africa. You'll see it in terrestrial examples as well, um, you know, with elephants and other species too. When you take out the apex predators, just like you take out the lions in Africa, right. there's not enough of them to actually pick off. Then their populations boom and they overgraze, and then there's not enough for them to eat, so they starve. Mm-hmm. So it's an unfortunate imbalance. Or you start and, to um, see the animals enter into a cannibalistic um, fashion. I don't know that they call it that, but they eat their own kind, which they wouldn't normally do out of starvation. I know that that was sort of a new thing among the polar bears. They started to see them eating their own young. Yeah, and that's, I mean, that's tragic and that shouldn't be happening, but it's because of this imbalance. Right. So where humans factor into that is that we are very much a, a consumer species, a take, take, take species. And so we need to be better about what we're taking and when we're taking it and where we're taking it from mm-hmm. and impose regulations. And a lot of traditional cultures used to do this. And I think U.S. regulations are getting better and better, but they're still significant room for improvement and it's a global thing as well but knowing that there's different species that are mating or moving during certain seasons it's as simple as applying a little bit of science applying a little bit of regulation and i have seen the health of marine protected areas the the trickle effect from that on fisheries on on wildlife in general on on local economies So marine protected areas, areas where there's no fishing allowed, where there's no take zones, where nature is allowed to do its course, um, have great economic benefits for humans. They have, I mean, there's enjoyment for tourists. There's health for ocean ecosystems. Everything is allowed to go back in balance. And even areas like Cabo Pumo in the Sea of Cortez, and the Sea of Cortez is pretty much a desert now. It's been very, very much fished out. But if you get a chance to go down and dive Cabo Pumo, you'll be restricted on the number of dives that you can do and how many divers can go, but you will see a thriving ecosystem. You will see lots of sharks. You will see lots of fish. And if you dive not that far outside of that, you'll see a little bit less fish. And then if you dive a little bit further away from that, you won't see any fish. And so for the majority of the Sea of Cortez, it's pretty much a Mm. desert. But in areas that have been protected, it's thriving. And not just the tourism economies to go down and enjoy those areas, but the fisheries around the marine protected areas are absolutely booming. So we have incentive, we have serious incentive, and we've seen the payoff from marine protected areas. Um, And what Dr. Sylvia Earle likes to call hope spots. Hope spots are like areas that we see great abundance and biodiversity that we know if we protect these areas could make a significant change for climate change, Mm -hmm. for the the Earth's carbon cycle. 80% of the air that we breathe comes from the oceans. We need to protect the oceans, even just for the fact of the air that we breathe, for the quality of the environment that we're in. And this is something that, you know, a lot of people would say, well, this isn't going to affect me in my generation. You know, why should I care? Well, what about your future generations? And what about what's going on right now? Do you notice the changes in temperature? Do you notice the changes in the seawater? Do you notice the market price of your fish going up? Do you notice the market price of your fish going up? It's because it's harder for them to go catch that fish because there are not as many of it. And people that are actually in the fishing industry, they notice that they would target one species, and then that species was gone. And so they move on to the next species, and then that species has been fished out. Now they're moving on to the next species. Yeah. yeah. Now that, and it's eating smaller and smaller and smaller. We are having an impact. No question. So, I mean, you. It, I was reading that scientists estimate that over the past 50 years, just the 50 years, 90% of the world's shark population has been killed off. Yeah, Whoa. Over 95% of sharks. Yeah, in the last 50 years, it's less than that even. And it's mostly due to the demand for shark fin soup, that Chinese status symbol bowl of soup, and they have the largest population in the world. Yeah. Middle class economy. Absolutely. Well, are there, are there any international laws or are there any national laws that you can point to and say, yeah, here's a great example. I mean, you talk about reserves. We've seen this with the bears and the lions and the elephants. It's, it's so tragic to think the only way an animal in a natural habitat can have a natural habitat is that it has to be cordoned off from human activity. It's like everything yeah. is so upside down and so sick. But 
hey, this is the world we've made and now we have to correct it. So it takes people like yeah, you, I'm you know, like... committing your life to it. It's beautiful, though. I want to thank you for all of us who aren't so comfortable in the water as you are that you can be a voice for the shark. But thank you, because it's not it's not just one person. I'm right. trying as hard as I can because I love these animals and that's my way of giving back to them because I know them. I understand them. I appreciate them on multiple different levels and so that's my way of giving back, mm-hmm. you know, trying to help save as many as I can. But it's not a single person effort. It's, sorry, hold on. Yes, you're right. It is all it's of us. Single, it's everybody and everybody has that chance. You don't have yep. to get in the water and go dive with sharks, although I do highly encourage you to go out with an experienced guide. We've got a great program out here in Hawaii. It's called the Pelagic Animal Research and Interaction Dive and actually helps fund research. But it gives people the opportunity to go out and experience. You don't have to take my word for it. You can come out and you'll learn about the biology, physiology, behavior, body language, and specifics on actually respectfully and as safe as possible swimming with the animals. You get to meet a shark eye to eye, face to face, and then you know for yourself and you're empowered from a firsthand perspective what sharks are really like. You get to see how incredible they really are. And I have to tell you, 90% of the people that get on the boat in the morning are terrified of sharks because what do they watch? They watch news, they've seen Jaws, and I would say 100% of them that come back love sharks. They say that they are so incredible. and they so share, with, share with us some of that. Out. You know, what, one of the things that's been interesting for me is sort of the interviewer of all these wonderful animal activists and animal lovers is hearing how their engagement, like when I talked with Linda Tucker, who has written about and has created the White Global Lion Trust and has spent now her whole life trying to save the white lions and others who I've interviewed. What's So what happens to you? I mean, what is it about the white shark for you, Ocean, that has so sort of come into your heart? What happens when you see a shark? What kind of telepathic communication do you have going on with them? I wouldn't necessarily say, like, telepathic communication. Um, I think anyone that's gone down to actually meet a a white shark, and, of course, everyone's experience is going to be different. But for me, getting to work around them and getting to see them in their natural environment, but actually getting to lock eyes with them. And you, there's no doubt in your mind when you lock eyes with a great white shark and you see it see you and observe you and you can see that there's a lot going on, that they're a very intelligent calculated species um but that right there it just automatically they command a lot more respect and i wish that everyone had the opportunity to go out there and actually lock eyes with a beautiful animal like that because it they would feel different about it and that's part of what i help facilitate not necessarily for white sharks because white sharks are a pet predators um that go after live marine mammals so they demand a high level of respect and I do not encourage people to just go out and jump in with a great white. Yeah, and I think um, and we should big. stop right there because I think that's really important and that's what all of these wonderful sanctuary givers have commented to is, you know, the idea here and you mentioned also that protected ecosystems where you can have some safe tourism that does not intrude on their own territory, does not intrude when they're mating, does not intrude when they're feasting, does not intrude, you know, in their in their natural lifestyle, but it's a lot better than killing them. And they have found that, by the way, also as test case um, in other parts of the country where they would change hunting to camera looking, uh, the economy was improved. And that was one way, actually, the Great Bear Rainforest Coalition was able to change the access people had to killing the bears versus it being illegal to now not being able to. And and maybe that will help you with the white sharks is look at how they progressively did it. And the way, actually, they got their strength was by coalescing all the indigenous tribal peoples that were native to the British Columbia rainforest area. So it might be, that's why I was asking about the Hawaiian peoples and the stories and the, and the reverence they hold the shark. Is shark guardi- guardian over something? Is the shark considered guardian over the ocean? Yeah, in, in some parts of the culture too. And you brought up a really good point about, you know, responsible tourism, responsible ecotourism. And the value of ecotourism versus, you know, fishing and finning. And that's something that we've tried to work on in different areas of the world is trying to convert fishermen um, to ecotourism. Mm-hmm. 
people would love to go out and actually see a live shark. If you just go out and you catch that shark and you spin it and you kill it, maybe you're going to make $125. That's all? Is that what you make? Wait a second. Wait, 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 wait. You know so much, and I know you have so much to share. What does somebody make when they just skin a shark? And do they skin the shark alive, or do they kill them first? No, actually, and they don't, on, honestly, they most of the time, they're not going to even skin it. They're going to hook it, and oftentimes this is on long lines. These are lines and lines and lines of hooks that could go from here to the moon and back. And they don't just kill sharks. They kill turtles. They kill dolphins. They kill all sorts of stuff. If you just lay a bunch of hooks out in the ocean, you're just going to kill indiscriminately. And so when they pull the hooks back in and they have the shark there, they hack off the fins while the animal is still alive mm. and it has to slowly bleed back. Um, it can't swim. And oh, without fins, God. it can't swim. So it, um, without swimming, they're not able to actually be oxygenated. And without fins, obviously, they're going to slowly bleed. So it's a really cruel, cruel practice. Um, the, the responsible operators in ecotourism, you know, in a perfect world, humans don't exist and they don't influence sharks. Sharks just go about and they keep the ecosystems healthy and it's wonderful. But what happens is really humans are killing 70 to 100 million sharks. What I'd rather see and what I, I like to work towards is trying to convert those fishermen over to ecotourism where they could take people out to see live sharks. Mm -hmm. And their sons and their daughters and their future generations could go do that and then their fisheries would be healthier. It's a very, very good answer and it has a greater economic benefit because like we said, like they, they kill a shark, they take its fins and maybe they'll get $125 but that shark isn't going to be around tomorrow to catch. Sharks are very slow to reproduce like any apex predators. When they pup, they pup a few young and their gestation periods are extremely long. So it's not a sustainable fishery. Scientifically, we know it is not a sustainable fishery. Most apex predators are not sustainable. So if you fish it all out now, what's left for your future generation? Yeah. Versus if you protect them, you have a benefit in your your company and the, the surrounding community. As you, Palau is a great example of that. They've protected all their sharks. Palau, Micronesia, and the South Pacific, okay. they've protected all their sharks. And their economy, the reason that they're protected is because they were able to show their politicians, um, a student uh, at what university was from, actually went over there and did the economic study on the value of each one of those sharks. And each one of those sharks, based on the number of divers that were paying to go out to see sharks, was just absurdly more valuable alive than they were if they were allowed to skin them. The Politicians th generally don't care about oh, this is important for our environment. They care about money, and yeah. they want to see statistics and money. Yeah. So when you tell a politician, hey, people are paying this much money, and I've seen this all the world. I've seen this in Philippines. Um, actually, one of the girls that worked in a nonprofit with me in Water Inspired, she actually did the global study um, for the value of a live shark versus a fin shark. And sharks are very much more valuable to humans alive. Um, we can't exactly measure the rate that they, they benefit the environment as far as the health of the corals and the fisheries. But what we can measure is the amount of money that people are willing to spend to travel to go mm -hmm. dive with a live shark mm -hmm. and how much money they're going to spend in the local economy to stay in a hotel, how much are they going to spend yeah. on airfare, how much they're willing to help protect the animal. And that's what gives me hope is seeing that the future generations come out on the boat, they get to meet a shark, they get to learn about the science, about the reality of a shark, and how excited they are about that and how excited they are to go again and go you know, spend time with these animals. And I do um, school presentations in elementary school and I do university presentations. And the younger kids are so excited to learn the science, the reality about the animals. They want to go out there and they want to know that, yeah, sharks do exist. It's no longer the, the jaw generation of, oh, the only good shark is a dead shark. So trying to move globally through like the International Shark Project because it really is it's an international effort to help gain better protection. I think one of the best ways to do that is to show the economic value of a live shark. So these areas that they're being fished and thinned out to try and convert those fishermen over to sustainable ecotourism, which is, uh, that's a whole other topic we can get into on, you know, what areas you're going and limiting, you know, your, your impact, your environmental impact on what species and in what area and not shumming a whole bunch and not having sharks, you know, run into cages and other things like that. Every effect probably has a negative effect, 
But the reality is, is that humans do exist and they are going to have an impact on the marine environment. Now, what kind of impact is that going to be? Is it going to be a positive impact where they're trying to make change? Or is it going to be a deathly impact where they just go out and decimate them? You know, these are all the issues that all of us who have worked in any kind of activist scenario of preservation for the Earth and all Earth species run into. And it's almost laughable that it's economics that brings us to sane response of what most of us or many of us just feel in our hearts is normal. So we'll be right back. Our guest is Ocean Ramsey. We'll return right after this. Hi, this is Carly Matamor. I've enjoyed being on the 21st Century Radio Show with Dr. Zohara Hieronymus talking about the white lions of Timbavati. To learn more about the white lions, go to www.whitelions.org. Or to learn more about the work that I do with Ahara Spiritual Community, go to www.ahara, A-A-H-A-R-A, spiritualcommunity.org. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Ocean Ramsey joins us. She's been called by the media the Shark Whisperer, and when you go to her website, Ocean Ramsey, R-A-M-S-E-Y dot com, you'll see why. So, Ocean, I want to come back to some of the more spiritual points about the shark and some of the Polynesian and Hawaiian traditions. You mentioned that one of the things people's believed is that an ancestor would die and go into being a shark, become a shark the next life. Share with us some of these mythologies that involve the shark, because I found in these great stories of indigenous peoples, we discover really the nature of these beings relative to what they teach us spiritually. Yeah, so um, like we were talking about earlier, in traditional Hawaiian culture, sharks are revered as amakua, and amakua is like a spiritual guardian or kind of a reincarnated uh, ancestors. So it could be kind of like your grandmother's and spirit. So when you would see a mono, and mono is the Hawaiian name for shark, it would be kind of a, a good luck sign. And many traditional Hawaiian cultures would take care of their sharks. They would feed their sharks, and they would protect their sharks, and they would seek them out, and they would keep them close to the villages. There is um, a, a journal entry in Captain Cook. Um, Cook's journals of him actually going to the Big Island of Hawaii, Kealakakua Bay, and um, the Hawaiians swam out to greet them, and they were described as swimming with hundreds of sharks and actually just gently pushing the sharks down as they swam out to the boat, and that the, the sailors were shocked that the Hawaiians were so in tune with their animals, with the, with the sharks, and respecting them so much, though. And so today... Um, you know, in, in the culture that we are in now, um, we sort to lose that connection with nature. So they're not as respected with, with all people. And when we travel different areas of, of the Polynesian area, we tend to find that the areas where the culture is more intact, the areas where nature is still respected, those are the healthier ecosystems. Mm-hmm. Of course. And there's a trade-off, though, because the areas where the government has stepped in, and like an area like Fiji, and they've sold all their fishing rights to China or Japan, their reefs have been decimated there. And that's an area where sharks are generally revered as gods. Mm-hmm. And so it's really sad to see the people that want to protect their animals, and maybe the government isn't a reflection of the people. And we were talking about earlier about economics, and that people are willing to go to travel to experience what it's like to be in the water with a live shark. And so that's something that we hope to hopefully get the the thin ban passed in Fiji by showing the value of a live shark over there. Mm -hmm. That's one of the top things to do if you go to Fiji is to go meet the incredible bull shark on their bull shark dives there. And so by getting a little science in there, a little tagging and finding out which areas need the most protection based on where sharks are spending the most time, um, that they've actually utilize that and have tourism mm-hmm. operations functioning in those areas. And the politicians can look at, hey, people are willing yeah. to come down here and spend a lot of money, so we need to protect these animals. Exactly. Well, well you know, it, it's worked other places, and when these models work, we ought to just keep using them and apply them to each special environment and the special needs there. How long does a white shark live in the wild if it's not caught by a human? 
It's hard to say. The way that we can tell is by ink injections um, into the cartilage, into the vertebrae. Um, so for white sharks, it's very difficult to keep them in captivity. Monterey Bay, I think, is one of the only ones that's been able to keep some of the small juveniles. So we can't know for sure how long. Um, there are speculations that they could live over 100 years. I think um, the general consensus right now is maybe around 75 years. Mm -hmm. But over a 100-year-old animal, whatever animal it is, especially when it actually reaches sexual maturity, it's very important to have that animal there for a balanced ecosystem. And it's the same thing when we go out and people fish. We shouldn't be targeting the older, the largest, the biggest animals. Those are the ones that are of reproductive age. There's actually a selective size that they should go into. And many fishermen, whether it be eagle or whatnot, they want to kill the largest and the biggest. And unfortunately, sharks, as far as trophy hunting, are often targeted, and great whites specifically are targeted for their jaws. And so even though it's an endangered species, and there's something called CITES, the Convention for in, uh, Trade for Endangered Species, even though there are international regulations on the transportation and sale of these things, there's still a lot of that poaching going on. For sure. Areas. Yeah, for sure. And it, within a pod, like, you know, among some of the longer lived animals, they stay together throughout their lifetime. I mean, you had mentioned that they're rather solitary animals. Is it the female that does the schooling? Who teaches the young ones? Um, sharks and, and fish, it's different for each species. So when you talk about white sharks, they're generally solitary. Um, when we talk about sandbar sharks or Galapagos sharks, those are schooling types. Or hammerheads, another endangered species, those are schooling species. And they're very easy to decimate their population because they school together, because they right. hang out very tight together. If you hook one, you might kill all of them. And the social systems are very complex with the animals, not something that's not published or not very well known. Um, with hammerheads, oftentimes when you see these pictures of huge schools of all these hammerheads, oftentimes those are all female hammerheads, and you actually find the most dominant or alpha sharks to be in the center of the school. We talk about sandbar sharks. If you see a big school of sandbar sharks, oftentimes the most alpha or dominant shark is going to be the highest animal on the water column. Mm -hmm. And those would be both male and female, but also segregated by male and male and female. The behavior depends on the species, and it also depends on the area of the world that they're in. So when I went down to Stewart Island in New Zealand, where we're looking at white sharks with limited visibility, those animals are acting and behaving slightly different than animals in, let's say, Guadalupe Island in Mexico, where they have great visibility. And so you can see the same species as they adapt to their environment, mm -hmm. what we call cognitive ecology is a newer, more emerging study, and actually seeing how the animals adapt to their environment. Now, the world over, people go and swim in the water, and generally you don't hear about a lot of mistaken identity bites. When you do, you really hear about it because the, the news, the media, press, they love to eat that stuff and sensationalize it and throw it around and scare right. people because to yourself. Um, but generally, given the number of people that are in the water every single day, and if you even just look at, like, the California coast, where we know we have like, half great whites, and they dress up in black wetsuits, and I've done this plenty of times too, and you're portraying a seal-like silhouette, and even if you're very efficient, you're not nearly as efficient as a sea lion, so you're acting like an injured seal. The testing is the animal sensory systems that people aren't just picked off left and right. And honestly, if the sharks, I say that sharks are very intelligent, but I think if they were really intelligent, they would probably just start eating people. Because it's an easy meal, right. and we're killing them at a certain rate. So... It's just a testament to the history systems. They are not malicious animals. Um, they are rather predictable. And I say rather predictable because wild animals are only so predictable. But they're a million times more predictable than humans and a million times more predictable than mammals because they're not exactly moody. And so when we study them and the information that we're getting back, the animals are extremely respectful. They're very, very imbalanced. They go after things that they identify as a prey item, but with caution. Mm -hmm. If you threw a piece of fish in the water with a white shark and you just expect, you would expect that it would just go for that piece of fish. But actually, they're extremely picky eaters. If you don't throw in the right kind of fish, and we know this from tagging because you do actually have to feed them an internal tag, 
and then we see them again for an external tag. So Ocean, I'm going to have to thank you for being with us. You you know so much. You have so much to offer. It's been thrilling to have you join us, and I encourage others to follow up with you. And here we are at the end of the hour. 21st Century Radio is produced by Hieronymus and Company. Our executive producer and research assistant is Laura Cortner. Our engineer is Noah Dankner. I'm Dr. Zohar Hieronymus, and we hope you enjoyed the show.